Uh, the first thing I want to acknowledge the Deaconate for the for the support on this on this on on this research topic that I was pre I'm going to present today, and uh, and this is the first grant I received uh, on this topic. Although I was working on the RNA imaging for a really long time, and uh, and today's talk is typically about uh, extension of the uh, of the sing uh, of the extension of the single you know uh, of the pretty emerging tools, which is called spatial transdomics, but the, we inter, we are trying to interpret the data and uh, try to develop new concept of biophysics, uh, biophysical uh, interpretation at the single molecule level. So um, I'm again, uh, I'm, a, I'm a biophysicist. So, uh, and uh, my work is primarily using some physical science approaches to understand the uh, the fundamental aspects of the of the of the of the of the DNA and RNA uh, in a single cell. So there's a two directions right now in my lab, and the one one direction is about this about the DNA um, um, biophysics. So we are interested in the chromatin uh, dynamics, chromatin structure, and its response, its role in the DNA damage, its response to the um, some mechanical uh, stimuli as well as some um, <clears throat> epigenetic modification as well as transcription. So in this interaction, the chromatin serves as the um, as the intermediate me uh, medium or the bridge between the some external uh, affection uh, with the some the the final product, which is the change of the gene expression. So on that on that direction, so let me see. <clears throat> on that um, on that direction, so um, my focus is basically on the RNA uh, imaging. So, uh, typically, we started from the RNA fish images, and uh, we also do some uh, live cell RNA imaging to see the. Uh, translational kinetics of each individual mRNAs in the cell, but that we, um, but the, in this talk we are specific, we are particularly, um, oops, we are we are. I'm going to particularly focus on the interpretation of the RNA in a single cell, and this work is primarily the co a very close collaboration with um, diabetic. Webbench uh, researchers Dr. Kamara Evans Molnina as well as Dr. Farouk Said from the uh, IU School of Medicine and Diabetes Center. So we have been working uh, working on this project for about more than three years now, and uh, and we got some very interesting results. And that's something I'm going to share with with uh, with everybody here today. So. Um, Starting from the from the from the from the fish, so this is a single molecule RNA fluorescence in situ hybridization stands for the very precise imaging and the very specific imaging of individual RNA molecules inside uh, a, a cell. So the very beginning uh, technique to do the fish is just using a dye conjugated with the single single strand oligonucleotide that will hybridize to the. Uh, RNA molecules and give the flower signal. So there were several issues regarding the uh, signal to noise ratio, the high background. So there's a several different versions of the uh, of the of the fish probe has been developed. For example, the fret or the molecule bacon or the combination of the molecule bacon and the fret, as well as some other you know quenching based uh, effects. So these techniques has been developed in the past ten years to make the single molecule fish. A, a very standard and a very reliable tools to uh, examine the expression of the genes in a single cell. So we always uh, want to. So we know that in 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 in, in biology, uh, not a single species can work on its own. For most of the case, it needs to cooperate. Individual individual genes needs to cooperate to to make one uh, one cellular activity. In that sense. Uh, we want to. We always want to see more genes, as many as possible. We never be uh, satisfied by the capacity of the imaging. So this is the initial effort to enable the multicolor, or we call that multiplex RNA image RNA fish, is just to do simply. We we use different types of colors, or we use different. Um, we also can use a lifetime or as this kind of metrics to differentiate different types of the RNAs. However, 
there's always a limitation or uh, always limitation of the number of RNAs that uh, that the system can resolve because that is limited by the wavelengths or the fluorophores. So about about ten years ago, a group, uh, there, there there's some barcoding technology has been developed to uh, label the RNA. So the idea is to instead of using a repetitive the same sequencing of the oligonucleotide and the fluorophore to look at these to hybridize to the individual RNA. So we can the scientists can design the specifically the, have a different type of design of the RNA fish probes to with which combine which we can combine different types of color to make sure that this RNA, a single RNA, a, a single strand of RNA can list multiple hybridization and cycles for the for the hybridization as well as for the image. In that way, a single mRNA will be needs to be visualized by several different cycles by co combination of different colors. For example, this typical example is that you can use uh, you can use these the the green color. And also, you can uh, you can use the green color to represent to represent one specific uh, sequence of the RNA. And you you need you can do hybridization. And then you can do you can uh, strip that out and rehybridize that. So each cycle will have different colors, and uh, and you can repeat these cycles to enable uh, multiplex um, uh, RNA imaging. So these are typical examples that is. Being reported about three, four years ago, that they can do, they can call sequential barcode RNA fish is sick fish, and this can, in theory, you know, um, this can realize the, with about eight cycles of the hybridization, you know, we can almost do, we can re, uh, realize theoretically sixty-five thousand of genes in a single cell. So it's almost a whole transform, a whole genome transomic imaging in a single cell. And uh, and uh, but there's there's some this is very powerful, but there's some issues uh, about the uh, about the about the uh, technology. For example, the efficiency of probe removal really depends on sample to sample, and also the efficiency. The rehabilitation is not very constant. The most important issue is that this hybridization each hybridization will basically take overnight. And in that way, if you do, do if you want to do eight cycles of the hybridization, that will take more than one week of your imaging. So this technically there will be some a lot of challenges. And uh, right now, but this technique has been commercialized by the NanoStream to as the Cosmax platform, um, as it has been commercially available right now. So I think the company has solved some uh, tech, many technical issues. And now um, the it's pretty reliable that you can get about up to five hundred or one thousand genes simultaneously from uh, from the system, and the system can also provide you similar image quality as you can see um, over uh, over previous. Oops, let me see if I can go back to the previous slides. The similar resolution as you can see over here. So in other words, they can provide a single molecule resolution. Another similar approach for the multiplex fish imaging is called a MERFish, multiplex error robust fish. So this, the, this is a very smart design of this fishing, uh, fish imaging strategy. So instead of, uh, instead of doing multi-color or multi-hybridization, so they separate the, um, the, the fish probes into two, two parts. One part is the hybridization part, which is the oligonucleotide, which is hybridized to the RNA. But this is not a kind of uh, repeated or randomized um, probes. So each probe needs to be coded and pre-designed to make sure that uh, each RNA has a very unique sequence of the of the code of the barcode for, of the uh, binary code, such as zero and and one. And then after every every after you deliver every probes into the into your samples, then you can do a different uh, uh, imaging cycle. So that there will be an imaging probe which is very specific to each individual oligo probe, uh, hybridization probe. So in that case, when you do the Im when you really do the imaging, you 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 you, you there should you should come out with a sequence of these uh, imaging probe. Hybrid um, conjugation. So you you deliver it 
your probe one, probe imaging probe one, two, three, four. The good thing, the, the beauty of this technology is that, um, you know, um, the for each uh, hybridization or each conjugation of the imaging probe or the fluorophore probe, you can use laser to turn off the previous round of hybridization. So you don't need to do the some, you know, a washing dehybridization. There's no mechanical disturbance to a sample. And secondly, when you design uh, another way, why they call it the error robust uh, design fish is that in the when designing the fish probes, the sequence of the probes for the each RNA molecules, there is a tolerance. So they leverage some algorithm from computing, from the binary computing. So that will uh, uh, totally reduce that, which will very significantly reduce the error when you um, when you code the sample. In that way, that will significantly reduce the um, misconduct um, rate of the of the of the probe of the of the detection, and this is a pretty um, a reasonable and a reliable approach. And the system that uh, that commercialized is called a uh, Merscope and by the Vistrin, and both systems are available right now uh, on the market and. Uh, it, this system has been um, emerging as a very powerful tools by many big projects such as Human Atlas. All right, after talking about these uh, uh, cutting edge tools, let's go back to the regular, you know, very simple single molecule fish images. So the quantification of these fish images, uh, there's several tools that is available. And usually scientists or the um, biologists pay more attention about these expression levels. In other words, how many dots you can see on each in the, inside each individual cells. There's several, uh, there's a platform available, which is this open source um, platform, which is called FishQuant, that you can do, you can that which can help you to count the full size, count the bright spots from the fish images. However, when you as you can see on the slot on the plot of the data. So there's the, uh, on this on this fish on this uh, quantitative results. There's only a number. So which means that the subcellular location of each individual RNAs, which is missing, and we and we all know that the uh, in 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 fundamental cell biology classes, the location of the RNA is indicating some different roles of the RNA. For example, we all know that the RNA is produced through the transcription and uh, is coming from is coming from the is burst from the cell nucleus. And then it will move, it will have some trans translocation happens inside the nucleus. And then it will be exported by the um, uh, through the, throughout the nucleus through the uh, through the nuclear pores. And then in the, it, when it goes to the cytoplasm, it will move again and have some transportation, which is facilitated, some, facilitated by some um, by some vesicles. And then it goes to the ER, mitochondria, cell membrane stuff to to do the translation over there and make that make the protein. So in through this entire lifetime of the of the RNA or the mRNA in the cells, it encounters different. It will in, it will go through different cellular compartments and it, which indicates different cellular locations. So in my in my understanding, and uh, that should tell us some information about the cellular function as this, as well as the cellular activities. So that's the major purpose of our um, of uh, major hypothesis of our work. However, these these ideas were not validated and um, you know until um, until very recent work, so uh, the the my my dream, my motivation towards uh, using the you know the using the subcellular location of RNA for phenotyping was basically driven by these morphology based phenotyping approaches, which is um, for example the cell profiler using the cell morphology, for example the cell shape, density, fluorescence intensity, as well as the uh, clustering and as well as the some other cellular compartments. So they use this, uh, they use machine learning specifically to quantify, to come out with several different quantitative metrics to characterize the features of this morphology. And then they use, they use, they use some supervised machine learning or unsupervised machine learning methods really can use these features 
as the as the basis to tell the difference between one sample and another, for example, how the drug treatment will induce the change of the morphology. So use this one as a metrics to do a lot of interesting uh, investigations. Then my 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 uh, my interest is uh, my my rationale is that you know morphology is a very general things compared with the ion locations because ion ion locations is highly in, um, you know entangled with the cellular functions and the cellular activities. So I think if we use the RNA locations in a cell in a single cell as the feature to class to 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 uh, to do single cell phenotyping. They should give us more accuracy and give us more uh, more information re, uh, from the sample to sample. So, but this this idea was uh, formulated a very long, uh, pretty long time, five or six years ago, when machine learning uh, and uh, AI was uh, emerging as an important tool for scientific research. But it was not uh, implemented until. Um, I, I met with Dr. Kamara and, uh, and Farouk uh, about three or four years ago. So uh, they come out with the samples of human pancreatic, pancreatic tissues, uh, isolates, and uh, they, conduct, they conducted some single molecule fish images, which is about this HLA DMA, DMB RNA. And also they want to see how each individual cells uh, how the RNA expression has been changing over, you know, for different type of samples from 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 for, for, time, for different type of tissue that is from the uh, control from healthy patient, healthy people, or the pa uh, patient uh, or the people with type one diabetes and the AAB uh, and and different type of other um, diseases. So they got the they got the tissue from the import respiratory and to conduct some standing about the DAPI, RNA, and also the insulin as well as the glucagon. So the insulin will be the identification for the beta cells and the glucagon for the alpha cells. And we are particularly interested in this HLA DMB uh, RNA expression. So to conduct this work, uh, the first efforts in our lab is to establish some imaging processing algorithm and the tools, which helped us to segment each individual nucleus from as, as well as individual cells that from the very dense uh, DAPI cha image channel of the tissue. And then we come out with the algorithm to do the correlation between the insulin intensity and the glucagon intensity to classify different types of single cell types. For example, on the panel C, these uh, different category of cells, beta cells has been identified. And we apply another channel to detect the RNA molecules from there. So once this has been identified, we specifically count. First thing we did is to count, was to count the RNA numbers that each individual cells, all right? So there's, uh, so there's a, in terms of segmentation, so there's a several different technology things we solved here when we initially work on the project, which is one of the first one is the segmentation. How, um, so for, for, the, for the, we developed several, AI-based segmentation approaches, well, which works very well for the cultural cells, but for tissues has been a long time uh, challenges. But, uh, and uh, one of our uh, deaconate um, uh, aim is basically to, to further optimize our tools to, uh, to do the, to, to give us, to give a better segmentation accuracy and specificity. However, the very recent announcement from the uh, Meta and the Google uh, and the Facebook is called Segment Every Anything. So they provide these open source softwares, which can, uh, which works amazingly very well on the, um, you know, on the on the on the on the tissue samples that we just connect, we just analyze. For example, you can see here. Even with some DAPI, you know, with nuclear channel, which you can see some nuclei inside the DAPI channel, they can do a very good job to sec precisely segment each individual nucleus in a very dense tissue. So I should say in the past, we have to spend half, a lot of time to manually annotate these nucleus to tell the computer, okay, this is the nucleus. And even that, the, the accuracy was not very high. And also another example is in this in this image 
you can see there's a big image boundary of the isolates that may interfere the segmentation accuracy when uh, for previous uh, data sets but with the with the with the facebook segmentation tools it it did a very good job to precisely segment each individual nuclei so i highly recommend these tools for uh, for the for uh, for any web bench scientist if you want to do the segmentation and it works very well for the uh, even bright field uh, cellular images so which means the m1 is almost completed uh, but the, uh, i'm just this is just a, a simple joke we have some other technical issues that we are trying to solve uh, in the in the m1 for example we uh, we want to identify some um, technical uh, issues when you're trying to um you know um what they uh, register your slides from one fish image to another for example the the proteomic images so this is always uh, a technical things technical issue and with this approach we got some interesting results finding out that the expression level of this RNAs inside the nucleus or inside the cytoplasma is quite different so which means that the expression level of these uh, uh, of this of this of this RNA inside the nucleus they, for the for the for the healthy people they have very distinctive expression uh, or the fraction compared with the patient with the type 1 diabetes so this case and this is interesting because our our collaborator in uh, in diabetes they think that this may tell us that this these some of these uh, protein activity or cellular activity is highly correlated with this uh, with this uh, location information of the RNA so we continue the investigation so we make we almost make this as a kind of standard tools for this single model, for the fish image data analysis so we repeated a similar analysis to look at the microRNA 155 in the beta cells so again this is the data that we extracted from this human pancreas all the data we have present here are mostly from the human pancreas um, human pancreatic tissues so from here uh, from the microRNA the the type 1 diabetes and the, the AB plus samples has the much higher nuclear localization uh, accumulation compared with the with the control samples so this indicates that the transportation of this microRNA from nucleus to the to the cytoplasm may be you know prohibited by some of the factors in that way the the um, although the overall expression in the in these cells are pretty high but there, there, you know, the, any kind of proteins that are with, associated with this microRNA 155 may be prohibited. So we think that is a kind of, uh, you know, genomic transatomic features of the of the beta cells that is associated with type one diabetes. And we also did the similar things on other type of RNAs, for example, the insulin mRNA. And this is the and and this is a really interesting results, particularly in the NOD mouse that as the as the uh, as the you know as the as the as the as the, as the sorry about that as the uh, diabetes propagating the, the number of the RNA in the nucleus is reducing or uh, as the is uh, as the as the um as the as the um as the diabetes propagating so all this work is basically give us a very different expression ideas about how these RNA molecules are specially loca located inside the nucleus versus inside the cytoplasma. And we want to know, and, and the interesting thing that is that the, the, the distribution or the trend is not always the identical for different type of uh, RNAs. So in other words, different RNAs, they have different uh, expression pr preference in the nucleus or in the cytoplasma. So we have many other data or many from based on other genes showing very different shared to the results and some of them are responsive to the uh, cytosine uh, treatment. So this basically motivated us to come out with the with a couple of questions. And first of all, if we want if we really want to use these you know RNA locations in the in the subcellular um, uh, locations RNA distributing the subcellular equation as the metrics for the for the phenotyping. So we should come out with some quantitative and statistical approaches that could 
that can be used to quantify the location, spatial location of the RNA molecules. And second, you know, how does the physical location of the RNA in the single cells have any biological significance? How that is correlated with the cellular function? How that is correlated with the cellular functions in the, in the beta cell? So to, to first, we come out with the uh, quantitative approach to basically answer the first question. To answer that, to do that, we come out with a very comprehensive and, uh, and the systematic evaluation of the spatial distribution of each RNA molecules in a single cell. So take an example of this data that uh, of, the, of the tissues. Uh, one cells of the tissues, it can be extracted to get a kind of reconstruction of the RNA nucleus, nuclear envelope as well as the cell boundary. So for each RNA molecules we identified over here, we quantify their physical location by four category of features. First one is the expression. So a second one is the, uh, their location. For example, their distance to the close, the distance to the uh, cell boundary, the distance to the cell centroids, and the distance of the nearest labors. And the, th the third category is, uh, is the clustering. So this is a, a major, and uh, information that we come out with this uh, statistical and physical and quantitative approach. So this, we use the feature, we use the function, mathematical function, which is called a replace K. And this is the value that represents how close, how, how the four size, how the clusters, are, how the four size are clustered in a very simple region of, in a radius of the circle. And the third, the fourth category would be some different uh, RNAs that, you know, we, uh, that is co-expressed in a single cell. How that is changed from one to another. All right. And, uh, and also in addition to the, uh, in, a, in, a, in addition to the, um, to the, you know, the, the, these four categories, we also identify the boundary information which is the cluster, clustering effect around the boundaries of the nucleus as well as the cytoplasm. And this is a typical replace uh, K or replace S function, which indicates indicating, so the X axis is a distance, which basically represents the, you know, the radius of the cycle, all right? And the Y axis is the degree of the cluster, which means the negative value means that it's very dispersed, but the po very positive value Means that they uh, they are they are they are aggregates. So in other words, if the particle is very you know stochastically randomly distributed, so for the so for the clustering uh, curves values function, you will just get a very flat, uh, very flat curve. So this indicates where the clustering is accumulating and is happening at a, what kind of range. And we. By analyzing all the single cell data that we extracted from the, 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 the human tissues, so we separate, uh, we separate the samples into two groups. One is a control, the other one is the type one diabetes or the AAB plus samples. And for each data, for each data, for each uh, set of data, there's about we have about a one thousand a number of uh, number of cells for the control and the, for the type one diabetes and the a, and the AB part there's around like seven hundred and five hundred. So to do the to do the to the next stage, we do the supervised learning. We separate we separate the data. We basically we separate data in two groups. One is for one is for training to establish the neural network, and the other one is for validation to. Uh, to for classification purposes, we we use a random forest to classify to do the classification, and the major output will give you the idea of um, the accuracy of the of the classification, as well as they will also give me give us the rank of features has been used to the to do the classification. All right, so as a comparison of this. You know, RNA features that we derive from the single molecule fish images. All right, we we also use a nucleus morphology features. So, which basically we all, we want to use the morphology feature as a control to see, you know, if it does the transomic feature give a better uh, classification accuracy compared with the nucleus morphological uh, features. And the result is yeah, is pretty uh, pretty um, uh, pretty 
uh, um, exciting and convincing is that which is that comparing with different groups of comparison comparison. So the um, the transatomic features always overcome the uh, accuracy uh, over overcome the the prediction accuracy of these morphological features. So the dashed line indicating that it is about 50 50 percent, which means that you couldn't uh, differentiate. So the, the the blue lines the blue lines indicate that accuracy uh, classification accuracy, which is um, uh, which is. Uh, based on the transatomic features and the red line stands for these morphological ones. So for, for different group of comparison, we can see the transatomic eigen features just overcome all, mo most of these uh, morphological changes. And if we try, we also compare different kind of uh, classify algorithms. Basically the random forest stands out as the best uh, approach for the classification. So in other words, here we validate that the uh, we confirm that the INA features stands out as the uh, as the major points, uh, major um, metrics that we can use to classify the the beta cells that are from the from the uh, healthy patient or from from the type patient with type one diabetes. And the very interesting thing that from this classification is that it turns out to uh, give a rank of you know uh, importance of the features that has been standing out as the as the, for the classification. So one thing, the top five features determined by this classifier includes the clustering, all right, around the nucleus, and also the clustering another in another region of the nucleus, and also uh, the expression level of the nucleus. So all these data, all these data, all this rank of uh, features indicates that the clustering is an important feature for the microRNA in the beta cell. So while my students come out with this, uh, my students come out with uh, some explanation about how this, how this, how this location of microRNA is associated with this, uh, you know, the triggering of the of the type one diabetes, um, and uh, they think that this is highly associated with the transportation transportation barriers of the nucleus of the beta cell nucleus towards the uh, microRNA 155 and uh, to validate that uh, we we took some of these you know uh, you know we cut, we cut coded the single cells based on the uh, uh, you know the replis k curves and typically from this uh, com from this color color image, you can see the validation Im validate the image from this control type one diabetes and AB plus samples. So definitely, we can see a much higher clustering at the boundary regions of the nuclear envelope. All right. So then um, to then it we basically as a as a biophysicist, I'm I'm very interested in why the RNAs are very special distribution distributed and another practical um, practical question for this work is that you know does the physical location of RNA has any kind of biological significance and how can we correlate these transatomic features we identified from the beta cells with some other cell with some other beta cell functions as well as some clinical implications so so um, we to understand the question that why the RNAs are specially distributed, distributed in, the, in, the, in the cell, we want to revisit the lifetime of the RNA in a, in a, uh, in a cell. So we found that it's the process of the transcription, all right, transportation, as well as the translation. So at different time points, if assuming this will be the lifetime, and then at different time points, it should be in different locations. In that way, I think it's very necessary to conduct some systemic, systematic RNA imaging at several time points. So in other words, we want to do the snapshot of the RNA positions in a, in a single cell. So we come out with two RNA regulation models. And the first one is using a RNA burst model. So um, we use the HeLa cell lines and which these cells is, is being treated by the interferon gamma. And this will induce the burst of the GBB5 mRNA in a single cell. And some of the nuclear, some of the recent uh, 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 literature showing saying that this 
this basically this these cells this kind of uh you know um treatment in tre uh, treatment will induce a second induction will have some transcriptional memory of the gbb5 expression in the HeLa cells so we just capture we just pay attention to the first primary induction to to use this model as in our in our research and in our study and the second model is is currently done by our collaborator in uh, in IU school medicine is try to use the human beta cells and we want to see upon the cytosine treat cyt cytokine treatment how the RNAs that we are interested in would be for example the insulin how these RNAs are distributed over the time all right to the, the for the experiments um for the experiments we basically catch ourselves at different multiple dishes and we want to uh, we want to we, we do the fixation of these fishes at different time points around the one two four and twenty hours and then we can we hybridize the fish single molecule fish probes into these uh, basically into these uh, cells all right and at the same time uh, we in addition to the gbp5 genes that we are interested in we also use the gap dh as a housekeeping gene as the control now, not only for validation but also for the calibration of the expression levels all right and uh, when we do, when we when when these samples are ready we use our house built single molecule house high throughput single molecule imaging system to conduct a, a systematic uh, imaging so we can we do the um we do we use three we use four channels for the imaging one two channels for uh, are the gap dh and the gbb5 rnas and we also use the um we also use the uh say a nucleus channel to identify the uh to identify the uh the nucleus and as well as a one more channel to identify the cell uh, their boundary so all the microscopy is, is controlled automatically um, by, by switching the laser on and off. So I'm not going into through the technical details, but I just want to mention that the number of the, the, the number of data sets that we have been connected. So this is the uh, some kind of um, the snapshot, the, in, the reconstructed images that we took from our system. And the left one is the entire um, region of interest. So this is about one, this is about two millimeter by two millimeter region. And we separate that into a 10 by 10 grid. You can see that's about 10 by 10 grid. And on each grid, we the region is the, the each grid is the, the imaging region is a couple of hundred nan, a couple of hundred micrometers. So we use this imaging system to do a single molecule imaging. And uh, for each grid, we conduct a three-dimensional single molecule image acquisition about 50 stacks. So when we do the image data processing, so we do the maximum in intensity projection of these uh, samples. And for each time points, we have about nine of these grids. So we have gr nine grids, uh, nine uh, slides of grids like this. So the total number, and uh, if you zoom in to one individual images, you can see the nucleus as well as the RNA molecules the, as the red dots, red dots over here. So this is really a data intensive uh, uh, project and experiments. And uh, for each time points, we we need to uh, we need we 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 need to connect about the one thousand cells for the for the following quantitative analysis. And uh, and for each uh, for each data set for each data for each slides uh, for each slice we have about for well, for each slides we have about two uh, three terabytes data for the for the for each slide okay so uh, we have we definitely spend a lot of time with, uh, to uh, figure out computational tools to optimize for the processing all right all right so this is the um, very representative images that I want to show you show uh, about the expression levels of the of the uh, of the GPB5 genes as well as the gap DH genes that is expressed in, in the HeLa cells over the time. So interesting thing you can see at the at the uh, time points around eight hours. So the expression of the GPB5 is just picked around this time range, and then the expression is degrading. So this is really exactly uh, following the uh, the the data that was pre published on the on the paper in 2020. And uh, but here we give uh, we yield a very high um, <clears throat> accuracy at the single molecule and single cell levels, 
And also we identify the number of RNAs, which is we do the quantitative measure to identify the RNA as well as the late mature RNA and the late and the and, and the latent RNA. The typical the latent RNA has been identified as a transcription site. This position is important because we will use this as the region to identify where is the RNA is originates, where the RNA is originally is coming from. So in that way, we, that will give us some information regarding how this, uh, how the RNA velocity and how RNA, how the RNA um, position is changing over time. So from the data, the RNA, um, the transcription factors is really depends on the time as well, and uh, the intensity peaks at eight and reduced after that eight hours and reduced after that. So the following analysis. We are doing the following, and we are doing a modeling analysis of the data we just acquired from the previous um, uh, experiments. So we want to use some um, some uh, some models basically to um, to understand the kinetics, all right, the degradation degradation rate, the synthesis rate, as well as trans transportation rate, diffusion rate of the RNAs. From, from mRNAs in the nucleus, as well as the translation rates in the cytoplasm. And in um, and the same, same times, we want, the next stage of the project is we, we are going to use the correlative or the, um, you know, the transatomic imaging as well as the proteomic imaging to see how these RNA molecules, uh, how the RNA features is correlated with the cellular function as, the, as, the, as well as the protein expression. All right, and finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the trainees from my lab, um, my postdoc, uh, Falun, who is to establish the very beginning work of this imaging processing. And uh, my graduate students uh, continue the work, did most of the, Garrick Chan did most of these special transatomic analysis, machine learning based analysis, and Clayton Helen did, uh, did most of these cellular based uh, studies about this uh, RNA distribution in cells. And I also um, uh, especially acknowledge my collaborator, Dr. Uh, Kamara Farouk and Wenting from IU School of Medicine to provide their uh, knowledge in diabetes uh, of, uh, and cell biology. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the fund support from the NIDDK, um, including um, R01 and our very recent R03 grants and the, this uh, DECANET um, bioinformatics program and uh, a pilot grant from the IU School Medicine Center for uh, Diabetes and the Metabolic Diseases. And uh, finally, I, I would like to acknowledge everybody here uh, listening to my talk. And it uh, looks like there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for Dr. Uh, Jin Liu's uh, great presentation. So uh, now is our uh, Q&A session. Um, during your presentation, I think there's uh, one uh, question from the chat. Uh, it's from uh, Dr. Klaus uh, Kaiser. So um, in the chat, it said uh, you showed how segment anything could segment nuclear, but you didn't explain how you segment segmented cells mm -hmm. as you did not, including a plasma membrane marker. Did you just employ a water shape model? Very good question. So, uh, so for, uh, so two, so I, I would like to, um, you know, separate this question into two parts. So one is, I think it's regarding the, the, um, the, you know, the, the tissues, for example, the tissue samples, the human pancreatic tissue samples, which is initially very crowded. And there's the only channels of the nucleus, so there's no markers for the for the for the basically for the nucleus for the cells. So how we do the segmentation of the cells based on the uh, you know in these tissue samples? So first we got the nucleus, we got the nucleus channel, we we do a segmentation on the nucleus channel, and then we did the ablation, ablation. We just ex expand the nucleus mask go outside until, for example, if there's two cells, which is, uh, you know, adjacent to each other. So that basically they will merge and they will stop over there. In other words, the boundary are uniformly distributed, you know, divided between two adjacent cells. That is working pretty well as we have validated that through um, uh, a, a, a kind of a membrane staining. On the other one, for the culture cells, well, we have different type of approaches to do the segmentation of the cells. 
One is the watershed algorithm that pretty works well if we have a marker for the membrane. And secondly, um, um, we just identified that we have another approach that we you developed to uh, do the segmentation of the cells just based on the white field images. Because when we, when we were working on the uh, fish imaging, um, our imaging modality is limited by the number of channels we have. So we cannot have a, uh, the, a channel, a fluorescent channel for the membrane staining. So we use, what we did is we use a wide field, um, wide field channel, but we, because we are connecting the three dimensional stack of the images. So in other words, when the, when the imaging depth is changing over the top to the bottom, so Typically, you got a DIC, kind of DIC based image, and we do some deconvolution approach where we can turn this, uh, uh, you know, the the depth contrast into into a kind of um, a fake fluorescence channel. So this is called volume contrast image, which is uh, very uh, quite use, useful in the in the. So it's been a kind of standard feature in the I think in the Nikon imaging systems imaging software. So we, we just uh, run the code to, to come out with our own um, approach to get that. And that and then we use that fake channel, fake, uh, you know, um, fluorescent channel for segmentation with the watershed algorithm, which works very well. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, you can unmute yourself or just raise your hand and then I will see. You can also type in the chat. So I can see a second question from the chat. Um, how do you think your approach comparing with the spatial transcriptomics tools that are available right now, such as uh, GeoMX and others? Well, I think, uh, you know, the GeoMax and the, the, the GeoMax, uh, you know, some systems that I just mentioned in the, in the presentation about from the spatial transcriptomics, they, they are very powerful. And, um, and, uh, and and they are very powerful because they the, they they count the expression of the genes at a single like, a single cell level, and then couple that with the spatial location of this RNA of the gene of the cells in a in a tissue microenvironment. However, I think the they they are they they just count on the uh, number expression of the RNAs each in each individual cells. So they they didn't pay attention to the to the uh, special subcellular location of these RNAs. So I think uh, our um, our uh, our work is uh, is uh, is kind of a, a step further into the subcellular location, and uh, and I, I think many people are paying attention to this kind of uh, um, uh, a phenomena and the data sets because this is the kind of tremendous data sets that needs a lot of investigation uh, that can can be very useful. There's a very recent paper on natural methods I think last week. Is talking about this. Uh, is talking about the subcellular location of the RNAs. How that is how that is associated with the cellular functions. So, but the, but again, uh, this kind of investigation will needs a very systematic uh, investigation about the you know transcription regu regulation. And if you uh, how to get because all this data is a snapshot. So how can we derive the transcri transcriptional regulation pathways? Based on the snapshot of the images, so that will be a very that will be that will need a very systematic study on the cellular level, like on the culture cell level, how each transcription regula regulation will be uh, leads to the final exchange of the expression. So there will be uh, there, there there will be a lot of things that uh, you know we can explore. Okay, uh, thank you. There is another question from the chat uh, from Carolina. So great talk, thank you. Uh, could you explain what the nucleic mRNAs are in the ratio nucleic cytoplasmic analysis? Are you referring to transcription site or mature mRNAs? Oh, that's a very good question. So uh, that's a very good question. So um, for the so for the for the for the initial um, you know, special analysis of this RNA mRNA uh, analysis in the nucleus on the salus plasma, so our attention uh, was initially was driven um, by a lot of, a lot of um, you know PCR experiments and sequencing experiments. So in that case, we pay we we were primary 
uh, interest in the overall RNA expression, which means including the transcription sites, all right, uh, and nascent mRNA as well as the mature mRNA. So we 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 use different strategies to count both, um, you know, RNAs. But when we do the so when we do the single molecule spatial analysis, we just pay attention to the uh, we we just consider can we just consider the, them as the single uh, RNA molecules in the in the in the cell. In other words, when we do the spatial analysis, we didn't we didn't split them out. We didn't you know for example, uh, just analyze the um, the um, transcription sites locations, or we just analyze the mature mRNA. But thank you so much for you know, picking that point. So that will be the next stage analysis for our for our cellular based work investigation to see why RNAs are specially distributed. So definitely, there we we are we are we are we are differentiating these two different types of RNA for the analysis. 